Hello everyone, this is Space Cafe Podcast, and I am Marcus. So, there I was, sitting in a pub in Kensington, London. I could have joined the other conference members at some fancy restaurant, but being an adventurous Austrian, I figured London was all about the authentic pub experience. Along with a Greek companion, a French woman and a Scotsman, we opted to hit the local pub instead. Hunger nipping at our heels, we dove into the menu, which was laden with delectable dishes. But I was in search of a quintessential British delight, fish and chips, a dish quite foreign to my Austrian palate. And then an odd detail caught my eye. Alongside the 16 pound price tag was another number, 1,777 kilocalories. Intriguing. Hmm. It didn't take long for me to realize that this was a well-meant attempt by British health officials to combat the rampant obesity pandemic on the island. Quite an innovative approach, I thought. But then, what does 1,777 kilocalories really mean? Is that excessive? Or not so? One of my fellow pop-goers wondered aloud. Interesting. For me, the realization was immediate. As an avid runner, I knew exactly what 1,777 kilocalories signified. To burn through that amount of energy... I would need to run approximately 21 kilometers, a half marathon, and that's not even factoring in the two pints of beer I'd need to wash down the meal, adding another 500 kilocalories to the total. To balance that out, a 30k run seemed to be in order. My dining companions were flabbergasted. I too was stunned, not just by the staggering calorie count, but by how a noble initiative like making caloric values visible could stumble without the proper context. Imagine if the menu read, fish and chips fuel your cravings conquer a half marathon, or indulge and then run like a champion. Now let's pivot. My guest today would likely be the saving grace for such health campaigns if she wasn't already engrossed in deciphering data from iconic telescopes like Chandra or James Webb. Kim Arcand from NASA is a master data storyteller whose talent lies in adding depth and context to the seemingly mundane numbers transmitted from the farthest reaches of the universe. Moreover, Kim will share her fascination with juvenile black holes, explore why technologically advanced civilizations seem destined for collapse, and discuss the often neglected discipline of space sound, plus a surprising twist. She'll also explore the thrilling intersection of AI and space science. So buckle up, my friends, as we prepare to dive into the cosmos and the tales that only a few can articulate. Welcome to the Space Cafe Podcast Studio with Kim Arcand, the expert in transforming nebulous data into captivating narratives. You're a data storyteller. What is that? <laughs> it's a made-up term. <laughs> you made I it up? Of, I sort of made it up just to try to express what I do, because it is hard, I think, to communicate sometimes. It's not always obvious, but... Most of astronomy these days is numerical, right? Astronomy runs on coding, it runs mm. on numbers. and It's not the fancy stuff they show us on in sci- a sci-fi movie. Right. right, when you just look up in one big telescope and you see it coming your way. No, not really. I mean... What do you see in a telescope? Like, is it... Numbers. Numbers. Right? So no images. No. So most of the data that we're capturing, at least I work for NASA's Chandrix Observatory, which is specific to X-rays, mm. right, from the name. And humans can't see that naturally, right? So we have to have a system to translate, essentially. Mm -hmm. So we capture the photons, those packets of energy Mm -hmm. that have been traveling to us. And, you know, they're captured on the detectors and 
through the scientific instruments, but then they're just packaged up into the form of numbers. Mm. And then that travels down to Earth through NASA's Deep Space Network, and eventually we just use software encoding to kind of unpack the Deep suitcase. Code. Exactly, mm. exactly. And then it's software to translate it into a table, to a spectral plot, to an image, or to something else like sound or a 3D model or what have you. So, Do like the, the real nerds understand the numbers and see the image in the numbers, or is that sci-fi also? Not really. I mean, it's truly, it's truly a process of translation that makes all that data useful. So, I mean, it, it quite literally starts out as just lines of ones and zeros. Mm. And no human can understand that sure. language, right? That's that's the language for computers. Um, once it gets into table format, yes, of course, humans can start understanding that. Um, but it is a different way of knowing once you translate it into something else, mm. into, you know, spectral data, into mm. an image, into a model or what mm. have you. So, yeah, it's, I kind of think of my job as just helping that series of steps along that pipeline, mm. right? Um, it probably sounds more fun. Science storyteller <laughs> sure, <laughs> sounds sure. more fun than what it's it It's a great job description. Is. But I do love my job. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, let's go back to, to Chandra. So sure. let's talk about this telescope, what it does, and how you decode and produce compelling stories. Yeah, yeah. So um, Chandra is pretty incredible. Like even almost 25 years later since its launch, it's still cutting edge as far as X-ray astronomy. It is the most powerful X-ray telescope. It's one of NASA's great observatories. So it's a sister telescope to the Hubble Space Telescope or the James Webb Space Telescope. And all of these different kinds of light, whether it's X-ray, infrared, optical, they all really do have to work together to sort of help piece together the puzzle that is the universe, mm -hmm. right? Because if you think of just optical light, you could think of a piano keyboard and you can grab middle C and a couple keys on either side and that's visible light. All the rest of the keys on the keyboard, that's all the other. Radio, infrared, and it's all invisible to us. So it's like right? most, We're most very limited. of reality is invisible to us. Exactly. And even more so than you know, we could start talking about dark energy and dark matter, which is like quite literally 95% of the universe is made out of that, which we can't even really Good. see, right? So, so we got like 95% of, we do not know what it is, and yep. we have 5%, 5 of, that we of can those only 5%. see a fraction of directly, <laughs> exactly. That's fast. So we're very limited if we're just thinking you know, natural human capabilities. But obviously our brains are very good. Sure, at interpreting, but we shouldn't take ourselves too seriously. We shouldn't take ourselves too seriously. Yeah, that's really an excellent point. And, you know, I think for me, just looking at what Chandra's able to accomplish, you know, it, it studies things like exploding stars, like areas around black holes, merging, colliding galaxies, baby stars that are forming, clusters of galaxies, like all of these really interesting things. And I think what's very exciting is that that data, you know, it's, it's just a part of the story of the universe at large, right? It's just a part of and complementary to all these other kinds of light or even, you know, beyond light to these different kinds of ways of knowing. But I think that facet of this work has really inspired my own path because when you're thinking of something that you can't detect with human eyes mm. naturally, there's no reason to just prioritize human sight mm. when you're trying to translate it, mm. right? You can translate it into something else. You can translate it into sound. You mm. can translate it into a haptic response. Mm -hmm. You can work with a 3D print. There are all these other ways of knowing. And I think that's it's open one of the exciting. Up for, up for yeah. grasp for interpretation. Right, exactly. Mm. It is. Yeah, which I think is pretty cool. So why is why is X-ray important? Because X-ray, most of, of, of our audience will know X-ray yeah. from their doctor. Oh, well, yeah. So it's it, the same it, kind of X-ray. It so, lets you look yeah, into something. It does. So what exactly. are we looking into with that telescope? We get to look into things like galaxies and see down to the cores where the supermassive black mm -hmm. holes reside. We get to see through the columns of gas and dust that make up, say, spiral arms of a galaxy and see the exploding stars and the dancing stars that dance in pairs as X-ray binaries and other kinds of really cool things. Um, we get to see through the columns of gas and dust where stellar nurseries are to see the young temperamental stars that are starting to mature and kind of throw these little temper tantrums. Yeah. Younger stars, they have a tendency to throw these temper tantrums. They're giving off this x-ray light, 
which, you know, sounds fun. But if you're a planet nearby that's forming, you have to be really careful yeah. of X-ray light if you want light, Burns off for example. Atmosphere. Yeah, exactly. We're very lucky here because Earth is incredibly, you know, protective. We've got this, one of the amazing superpowers of our planet is that it's got this wonderful atmosphere that's actually very thick. And so that atmosphere protects us from all of those X-ray photons that exist out in the universe because of the, the thickness huh. of the atmosphere. It's kind of like... An X-ray would have to go through like a, a 15-foot wall of concrete to get to us because of our atmosphere's protection, which it can't do, right? So our Earth, Earth's atmosphere protects us by absorbing the X-rays, um, which is great for our life on Earth wow. because I don't think we would quite be here if we didn't have that so, protective atmosphere. I mean, like lots of coincidences must yeah. have happened. Yeah, right? lots of serendipity. For us to sit here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Many, many thanks to Earth's atmosphere <laughs> for giving us a place to come home. So. Wow. Wow, fascinating. So what? what's your favorite image, your favorite Chandra image? Oh, so Chandra has been looking at the X-ray universe for, again, almost 25 years. And as weird as it sounds, one of the very first images that we ever looked at with Chandra, it was the Cassiopeia supernova remnant. And I've talked about this object a lot because it's just... It's very cool. So right out of the gate, Chandra looked at this object for about an hour, mm -hmm. um, that first month that it had kind of opened up its eyes, if you will. And it's the beautiful exploding debris field of this star that just exploded its guts out all over the place. Mm. And the image itself had a bright white point source right at the center. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the evidence for the neutron star that hadn't been found yet. Mm -hmm. That's like essentially the leftover core of the star that had exploded. So one hour of observations, one of its first things that it looked at, and not only did this beautiful image emerge, but like evidence for like what happened mm -hmm. to that star. And over time, we've built up more and more data to it. So now we have like two million seconds of data mm -hmm. to look at. And now we can cut all of that data into like layers. So you can understand where the iron is, where the silicon, where the sulfur, where the calcium, right? All of mm -hmm. those chemical elements. Mm -hmm. And what's cool about that is you can actually map it. So it kind of looks like a weather map when you color code it. Uh, you can color code iron to purple and silicon to green, whatever your color code is. But what it does is it shows you that the iron is around the perimeter. And right before a very massive, a supermassive star explodes at its core, iron builds up. And when it explodes all over the place, the fact that the iron is now on the outside tells you that this is evidence that that star turned itself inside out when it exploded. So just being able to get such good data really lets you map, like, the mechanics, if you will, of that star's explosion. And that tells you about that star's life, right? So it's like a CSI <laughs> kind of, like, crime scene investigation almost because we can learn about stars and their life by understanding their death. In what form do these elements, like iron, exist out there? Oh, like, like pieces, bits and pieces bits of and iron? Pieces, it's or is molecules. it dust? Yeah, it's like molecules, essentially. That's It's just all of these, you know... Little bits of uh, chemical elements are just floating out there in space, but they're at a density where we can observe them and capture that information, and they're slowly dissipating out. Well, I say slowly because maybe mm -hmm. cosmically, but they're going out pretty fast as far as human terms, hundreds of thousands of miles per hour. And it's just, you know, expanding out into space. So these are very dynamic, changeable, exciting kinds of objects to look at. Exploded stars are probably one of my favorite things in the huh. whole universe. Yeah. Because, you know, it's like the story of us in a way, right? Our, the iron in our blood, the calcium in our bones, like those chemical elements came from previous generations of stars. So a star started. had to die for you. Exactly. Me. Isn't that so beautiful? It's like, very romantic. And it's such, a, it's such a loop, right? You know, the universe it has these great cosmic recycling centers, these stars that explode, but also things like black holes that are the ultimate sort of cosmic recycling centers, you know. Black holes have these like bad reputations for just being cosmic vacuum cleaners <laughs> and harbingers of doom and going around the universe sucking things up like crazy. But they're not. I mean, don't get me wrong. There are some black holes doing bad things out there. <laughs> and I wouldn't want to get too close to one and be spaghettified mm. into like molecular spaghetti. No fun. Um, but they're also very green. Not green as in color, but green as in recycling, right? They're, they're responsible for the care and feeding of their galaxies. They're... Um, just, yeah, giant recycling centers, just the accretion disks and the jets that are coming out of them, the material that's escaping, like it's powering off some really cool things. So there's a lot, I think, to space that happens at these really large scales that 
is actually quite useful to just even the story of how we would have come to be because we would have had to, you know, come from generations of stars that exploded, of things that were mixing and being recycled throughout the universe. And I find that kind of cool. Awesome. How, so how, how would that formation of matter as we see, like here we have a wooden table, mm. we have metal bits and pieces here. Yeah. How do these things end up here? Well, that's a great question. I mean, it's again through, I say, just billions of years of material um, slowly coming together, slowly. In the form of clouds. In the form of gas clouds, right? So like even when our solar system would have been forming, our sun would have been that protostar at the center of a really massive disk of material. And it would have had to slowly start like clearing its path. And as all of that material is swirling around it and starting to have that like nice gravitational pull towards it, things are coalescing, things are clumping, things are accreting. Like Building all of these, gravity. exactly. All these processes are, uh, processes are occurring over for us very mm. long periods of time. And slowly things merge and coalesce and create new things. And eventually, we're here. I mean, there is a ridiculous amount of steps in between, right? <laughs> but I mean, in the essence of things, that's, I think, just a really cool story of just how the universe has been forming over time. So, yeah, I don't know. Huh. This is so fascinating. But again, too many coincidences necessary. Yeah, is, right. is all this a miracle or what's going on here? I don't know, because to me, like mathematically speaking, when you think of all of the exoplanets, the planets outside our solar system that scientists have found by now, there's so many of them, right? They're, they're essentially finding that even within the Milky Way galaxy, most stars have a, a planet or two or three or four or more, right? And if you think of the billions of stars just in our galaxy and the billions of galaxies <laughs> that are in the universe, like those numbers just yeah, become staggering. ridiculous, right? So what are the chances that not one of those other planets has had some sort of life form and evolve on it? Like mm. mathematically, that seems impossible, right? Because the numbers are so big. But there are all those questions and like the Fermi paradox talks about this very neatly. Where is everyone? Are we are we early to the party? Did we happen early? Are we late to the party? Mm. Have like other types of life come and gone? Or is it just because the universe is so darn big that all the perfect things that do have to happen have sure. to line up so well that, you know, maybe this has happened across the universe. We'll never be able to detect yeah, that, absolutely. you know? So, yeah, those kinds of questions, I think that's so cool. Like, I did a lot of biology as an undergrad in college, and just being able to bring it back to that root of life is very interesting. Mm. And, yeah, no one has the answers, which I love, too. So I think one of the fun things about astronomy is, like, every time you answer a question, you get, like, 10 more. Absolutely. You never really get an answer. You just get more questions, yeah. you know, but I like that. <laughs> Not everyone does, but I do. So, yeah. So you mentioned all those stars and planets and exoplanets. So it seems like there's a lot of matter out there. Yeah. But at the same time, one could say the universe is very empty. Yes. So what is there's it? There's a lot of space it, in space. Oh, what is the prevalent thing out there? Emptiness or Oh, matter? yeah, definitely emptiness. I mean, the amount of matter in the universe, like baryonic normal matter, I think that only makes up literally 5% of the universe. <laughs> so like, you know, take a jelly bean jar. Yeah. And fill it up with almost all black jelly beans and maybe, you know, sprinkle just a few colored jelly beans in there. And those colored jelly beans are like stuff like us and all the stars and all the galaxies and all of that gas that we've been talking about. And the rest is just other. Wow. wow. <laughs> yeah. Dark matter, dark energy, not not people, not not planets, not the usual stuff that like our brains are a little more comfortable thinking of, you know, it's kind of cool. Well, and the odds that we are finding out in our own lifetimes what that dark matter is, because now with the arrival of artificial intelligence, maybe oh, yeah. we have an ally yeah. now yeah. at our hands. I would hope so. Yeah. If we do a ray, it'd, it'd be a great ally in astronomy. And I don't know. I mean, it's taken a while just for people to understand that there is something like dark matter and dark energy, and people don't really get what either of them are, you know, a force attracting things in the universe and a force pushing things apart in the universe. That's kind of vague, right? Mm. So there's a lot to figure out. There are a lot of incredible researchers doing really interesting work on it, but 
how long before we really understand all of these things? I don't know. How long before we find another form mm. of life? I don't know. How long before we mm. kind of, you know, like really dig into some of these mysteries? I don't know. But yeah, potentially AI is the, the opportunity to help mm. speed up some of those discoveries, possibly. Mm. I hope. There's an interesting theory I'm, I'm sure you know a lot more about, and that's the, the great filter theory that um, life is doomed to end up destroying itself yeah. because all life may be ending up as a technological mm -hmm. civilization and yeah. every t technological civilization destroys itself. Yeah. I mean, like we're doing our best. Oh, it's scary. <laughs> I know. Right now. But could you speak to that? What I mean, I, I can't. I'm definitely not trained yeah. in that area at all. But I do love the idea of thinking about what humanity is doing and what it's able to become and I don't know. I'm one of those people that's also deeply affected by like climate change. Like I'm a total tree hugger and just, mm -hmm. you know, I do. I th unfortunately, it has turned a slightly cynical dial up in me a little bit that the more and more we get away from the incredible gift that our, our planet mm -hmm. is, especially when you look around at all of these other thousands and thousands of exoplanets and find like horrifying worlds, mm -hmm. worlds where it's raining glass sideways at like thousands of miles per hour, shredding any potential existence, rains where you'd be like fried in a nanosecond on one side and like frozen in a nanosecond on the other side, like worlds where there's just pools of sulfur and poisonous gas and zombie stars orbiting with like, you know, dead planets. I mean, some of these other places just sound terrible, right? And so our planet to me is just this incredible, beautiful paradise, right? And there's definitely like this strong sense of must take care of. So when you start compiling, like, compiling too many of these technical things that we don't yet quite understand, when you look at things like doomsday clocks and all this stuff, like it's not hard to really think that things could go wrong quickly if we don't pay mm. better attention mm. or if we don't take our time with things a little better. Do you know what I mean? Mm. If we don't slow down and really understand the ethics and, you know, impacts of technology before we jump in. And I say that, by the way, as someone who's like always interested in new things. Mm -hmm. Like, so, you know, I'm, I'm being slightly ridiculous, but um, like I'm super interested in what AI I will do. And I jumped into XR very quickly and all these other kinds of tech I find fascinating. But then I see the impacts, too. Mm. And it just makes me wary of like what that will mean for all of mm. us on the planet. You know, I don't know. It's it's slightly depressing. Let's let's do a happier question. <laughs> sure, sure. Happy question. Happy question. <laughs> Good happy stuff. Okay, so we started with the Chandra telescope yes. sending data mm. from your favorite spot, yes. whatever that is. Yes. Now the data comes in, you see a bunch of numbers. What next? So it's all about translation at that point and fantastic software that the systems engineers and everybody else have been working on for, you know, decades, essentially. Um, so it's just taking all of that data and extrapolating it out into a form that you want to study and then a form that you want to like produce into something. So scientists are going to start out pretty early on by just looking at the table of data, looking at the plots that they can extrapolate out, trying to understand like the mechanics of these objects and these phenomena. And then from there, usually some other thing needs to get produced, so whether it's an image um, or whether it's just some sort of plot or whether it's sound or whether it's a, a model or what have you. So more software is used at that stage. So you've already kind of locked down the scientific story by then. You understand what the scientific points are of that that collection of data. And then your next step is to figure out like how best to serve that data by storytelling mm -hmm. it in a way that is useful um, for the science. You know, you're trying to like squeeze out all of the, the lemon juice from those lemons to make some really nice lemonade. And so to make that lemonade, you can you can do a mm -hmm. different way. You can make lemonade sweeter or not. You mm -hmm. can make it more water or not, right? So it's all those decisions that you're making. So someone like me might come in to create an image and try to understand, all right, with this exploded star that we talked about, right, we have this great rich data that showcases all of those chemical elements. We want to color code those so that we can map it out so that you can see the distribution and understand how this star lived or died, right? Or we've got slices of this data over time because we've been observing it for almost 25 years. And so you can slowly stack those layers over time and see the actual expansion of that remnant. Or you can figure out which of the data is moving away from you, which of the data is moving towards you using the Doppler effect, mm -hmm. you know, you can get ambulances. Um, and then that allows you to create a three-dimensional model. 
And once you have a three-dimensional model, do you need to bring in a DEXR? Are you going to 3D print it, right? Or, you know, are you working with colleagues who are blind or low vision? Are you working with community partners who are blind or low vision? Do you want to create a sonification mm. that'll turn it into sound? And I'll be honest, when I listen to things versus when I see them, right, I'm, I've am i been working in this, this little treasure chest of data for almost 25 years. I know the pixels really well now. I can hear the data and think of something completely different. It'll change how I view, um, how I understand, or how I kind of, you know, add my own meaning making. And this is like, again, someone who's kind of been, you know, drowning in this data, right, for a while. We had Matt Russo on the show. Oh, yes. So I work with Matt. Matt's a wonderful colleague. Yep. Fascinating. So, we got to listen to his work. Yeah. This is so beautiful. He played it to me and I... I tried to find out what I was yeah, hearing. Oh, he said he was recording a podcast yeah. this week. Was that yeah, with yeah, you yeah, yesterday? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was the day before. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, um, Matt and I have been working together since 2020. Well, and Andrew, too, of course, um, to create the Universe of Sound program. And so um, the Chandra data, and you might have listened to some of these, um, has been, I don't know, I think it's been an, an exceptional gift to this kind of process of sonification. And the black hole that we did for the Perseus Galaxy Cluster has definitely been one of our most famous. That was an image set that we worked on um, back in 2003. Uh, Andy Fabian from the UK, a scientist, had essentially figured out that in this cluster of galaxies called the Perseus Cluster, there's a supermassive black hole at the very center, and there's all of this hot gas around it. And that black hole is sort of burping out into that hot gas, causing pressure waves, which are essentially these sound waves. And using excellent math, he could calculate um, that it was a B-flat, about 57 octaves below middle C. <laughs> deepest yeah. deepest know in the universe, yeah. right? So when I worked on that story back in 2003, I just, I fell in love with that story. Because who doesn't want to, like, think of these divas yeah. out there in the universe singing their song at, at a level that humans can't hear because that many octaves below middle C, that's hundreds of keyboards beyond yeah. what we can hear. It's so deep, right? So I don't know. It just really struck my imagination that there are these black holes just singing out, you know, singing their hearts out yeah, yeah. into the universe and we're too far to hear yeah. it and there's no stuff in between us and it and the sound is it too low. It doesn't propagate. Right, exactly. So what do we do? We resonify it using this method of sonification to bring it back up about 57, 58 yeah. octaves so that humans can hear it. Yeah. And that that piece, that was one that we released last year. I think we've done a couple dozen by now. Um, it went hugely viral because people heard the song sure. of a black hole. And I think an object so esoteric and abstract, right? Like to really wrap your brain around a black hole is not easy. Um, but to hear it, yeah. right? Sound, music, they have like this sort of sticky fingerprinting in your brain, right? They, and that's personality right? to the object. Yes, exactly. It gives you something yeah. to to stick to. Yeah. It gives your imagination something to hold on to. And I think that's been very exciting. And this whole project started because during the pandemic, me personally, I felt very isolated from my colleagues. We had been doing a 3D printing project for a while with some of our 3D models working with our colleagues and our community partners who are blind or low vision, and it felt cut off, mm. right, just with all the isolation. And I had reached out to Matt because I'm just like, I, I just have to try something new. I had been dabbling with sonification with my students mm. in virtual reality, mm -hmm. um, like geospatially attaching sound to things like the Cassiopeia Supernova Remnant. And this project was just a way to try two-dimensional data set translation into sound. And it's just been one of the most fun things to work on. I, I don't think I even realized like how important this project would become, just the public response to it, the positive feedback from um, the blind and low vision community, the interest that it's generated. You know, it's really provided a new way of thinking about things like X-ray light. Um, and yeah, working with Matt and Andrew and our other partners, we've brought in um, Christine Malik. Mm -hmm. um, she's a amateur astronomer. Um, and visual describer or accessibility expert who's also blind. And having the input of community members has been just wonderful because they really can just keep a true check on sound. Like their sound um, sensing capabilities is mm -hmm. just amazing. And Christine in particular has such a sort of poetic nature um, to the way she approaches these things. So, yeah, we've assembled like kind of a little mini A-team, I think, <laughs> and, and just been able to do some really incredible things with it. So... Yeah, it's been a you know, dream. You know what's interesting? 
Now that you're mentioning that sonification tangent, I mean, like all of astronomy is visual. Yeah, historically. But this is just one of our senses. Exactly. So why not build like the the telescopes for the other senses? Exactly. This is exactly right, right, right. right. So like, yeah, so historically, you know, humans have looked up, right? For millennia, we've looked up into the night sky. It's the obvious thing to do. It's the obvious thing. It's the easy way. Yeah. And, you know, then Galileo and his cohorts came along and they started drawing, right? And then they started capturing on, like, large glass plates. And then we went to CCDs, right? So slowly, and then, you know, X-ray astronomy and other types of, like, you know, invisible astronomy, if you will, launched once we had the technology. And now it's like a freeing again because you don't have to just prioritize the visual, especially when you're dealing with X-ray light, invisible, infrared light, invisible ultraviolet light, invisible, right? All of those different kinds of light. Um, and there's such a different power to using your senses. I will probably stop at smell and taste. <laughs> I don't personally want to smell sulfur and I don't even know iron and all of that. That's not for me. Well, I hear that space, um, outer space smells or tastes like bacon. Yeah, and, I've heard and, that too. And what? Bacon and kerosene? I'm a vegetarian, so <laughs> I don't want to hear that. I'm like, asking... <laughs> I'm asking myself who tried that. <laughs> I don't know. But it's an interesting experiment to whoever figured that out. And I, I think, again, why I would want to stop at taste yeah. and smell. Because, no, thank you. But, you know, tactile response and hearing and sight, like those, I think, are, are definitely, all, I'm all in on. How does the scientific community react to it? Is it too esoteric for the, sci the, the yeah. real scientists? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I will say... At first, it's, it took a little convincing. I don't think everybody was all warm and fuzzy to the idea. Mm. Um, but I think one of the positive things I've seen, at least within my own area, um, is that as we've tried these things and launched them out into the world and they've done well, well, you know, positive sure. results begets more positive thoughts, right? Right. And so that is really lovely to see. Um, but that said, I shouldn't, you know, shortchange the fact that there have been quite a few scientists working in this area of data sonification across many different fields, by the way. They work on sonification on, like, DNA, protein folding, mm. oceanography, seismology, like, all of these different areas that sonification is useful for that has been an area of, of valid study. And in astronomy, the reason I was interested in sonification was because of a dear friend of mine, Dr. Wanda Diaz. Um, she's an astronomer and computer scientist, and she's been blind since she's a teenager. And she has been using sonification as a way to study stars. And for her, that is how she has to approach her data. It is a valid research tool. Mm -hmm. She writes the software so that she can get a sonification of her data and mm -hmm. study stars through that. And there's value there because... You can look at variable stars. Variable stars are stars that are changing frequently. And you can get lots of plots from them. But looking at plot after plot after plot is one way to study them. But listening to the changes, the variability in the data is another way. Um, and the studies so far, there'll be more that need to happen. But the studies so far have shown that scientists, humans, can learn to become better listeners if they have the sense of hearing. And that that is a valid tool to use for research. So I think, you know, this idea of sonification is not just useful for communicating to people now, but also to communicating to future scientists that there are other ways of knowing uh, that you don't have to be excluded if you don't have sight from a, mm. a field that has been historically so visual. Um, and there's definitely power in that. So, yeah, yeah. This is so beautiful. Oh, good. Because, uh, it, because it's so inspiring to me. Yeah. Because uh, we're just... Scratching the surface. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Right. Like this this project that we're working on with Matt and Andrew and Christine is like one project out of many. Um, there are scientists working at the Space Telescope Science Institute to do like very specific, create software to do sonification, um, definitely at larger scale, auto sort of auto sonification to use for research. I know there's a ton of scientists around the world doing really cool things with it. And I can just kind of picture a world in the future where, you know, there's, I don't know, a scientist here and another scientist in Japan, and they're working in XR with data sonification in real time across distance at the beginning of the data pipeline versus mm -hmm. at the end mm -hmm. of that translation process. And what can you explore and what can you mm -hmm. learn, you know, when you're taking your data in those mm -hmm. different ways? So, yeah. Are there any very cool art projects you could 
p- point point our attention to. I mean, like yeah. we have the mu- musicians doing yeah. sonification, but what else is that out there? Oh gosh, there's a lot, and I, I think it's really exciting because we're approached all the time. I, I've definitely been approached by a lot of artists. There's an artist who's interested in working with some of our three dimensional models. He's like blown blown them up into huge scales, which I love because. Uh, this object that I've been talking about, our good friend Cassiopeia A, right? It's uh, in a, a good it, friend. It's a very dear friend of mine, <laughs> um, and hopefully a dear friend of you and your listeners. Um, and it's you know this this beautiful debris field from the star that exploded, and we've got a three D model of it, and so we can three D print it. And when we hold a version of that in our hands, it's like maybe four inches across, maybe ten if you've got a really large three D printer. But when you're blowing them up at scale, you can get them even bigger, you know, and through like light projects, you can get them even larger, like to the scale of buildings. Those scales, of course, are nowhere near the actual scale because mm-hmm. it's about 40 million billion times the surface area of our sun. 40 and million billion. billion times. You can toss Pluto into that if you want, because it doesn't matter at that scale calculation. But like that's the mass of some of these these objects in the universe. And, you know, when all is said and done, Cassiopeia A is just a tiny drop in a drop in a bucket, yeah. Right. And what the universe scale is. Um, But I think artists have a very particular way of approaching things. It's just a different kind of lens to things like scale, magnitude, understanding, and expression. Um, We're working right now with a young composer. Her name is Sophie Kastner. And she's taking the data sonification project and actually extrapolating it out into sheet music that can be played by... Orchestras. An ensemble. Right, exactly. (laughs) So flute former flautist here, <laughs> um, oboe, violins, cello, percussion, right, to play NASA data as a piece. How close, uh, how much interpretation is that? How close is there that to There has to be interpretation because when you sonify data with a medical mapping, like this project mm-hmm. that we do with Matt does, um, you have all of that digital information at your disposal, right? So you can create layers upon layers of sound to represent the density of the data, right? But when you're a musician, you have different tools at your disposal. You have time, right? And you have all of the nuance mm-hmm. that your your little tiny instruments, right? Or your big instrument, whatever it is, um, can provide you. So for Sophie, for example, what we're doing is looking at extrapolating sections of the data out because the entire data set is too big for, you know, a 10-piece ensemble mm-hmm. to do. But you can extrapolate the data out and she can keep the science pretty accurate mm-hmm. and true. But you just have to do, you know, like a sightseeing tour mm-hmm. through the data, mm-hmm. right? So you're not doing the entire data set. You're doing kind of like the the best places to see, exactly. right? Mm-hmm. And extrapolating that out. Route. It's a scenic route that you can play. <laughs> yeah. And I find that really exciting. Like the fact that, I don't know, I used to be in band class, right? And so, and choir. And I, I can just think of like kids in school, like singing black hole sounds or, you know, playing an exploded star with their violin. Like, how cool is that to be able to bring NASA data into a totally different... Totally. And I can, even now with the arrival of ChatGPT, I could totally imagine to feed that data into ChatGPT and ask it, tell me the most most beautiful moments. Mm, Or the most, the grandest or the the brightest or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And... In the style of William Shakespeare. Right, 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 exactly. And see what it does. Yeah. And I think that is like one of the really cool things about what AI and machine learning will do for us. Like just give us different views. You still need the person. Mm -hmm. You still need the, you know. The right question, the right Yes, exactly. You have to have a human guide. That's Mm -hmm. not going away. But there's definitely potential to lead us in new directions, I think, when you've got different Mm -hmm. ways of considering your data. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. What's the next big thing out there for, oh, for the science community? Well, I definitely think AI is coming and mm-hmm. coming soon. I don't know how exactly, but we're just starting to investigate, like, what are the ramifications of using AI to do research? Scientists are already incorporating AI into their work, particularly it seems to be more machine learning, neural networks kind of thing. Um, I'm interested in that myself, like procedural generation in between versions, like stages, if you will, of stars over time and their evolutionary path, how procedural generation can like fill in the blanks in between a 3D model you have of, you know, a 10 solar mass star here versus where it is Mm. here in its timeline and getting it much closer to feeling, you know, filling out all of those stages. Um, I'm really interested to see how machine learning can help us extract more out of our archives, our data archives, make them more efficient, provide more 
you know, stuff for the public to be able to consume as well. Obviously, more discoveries, like using it to be able to image process more efficiently, be able to mosaic and composite your data um, without having to hand crank mm -hmm. it quite so much. Um, I think there's like a lot of those small things that I'm assuming is where we'll be starting with some of this and that it could potentially grow mm. beyond there. Um, but I'm really excited to try it. There are, of course, the the ramifications to consider. You know, what does that do for questions of public trust, right? Mm. If you're using AI, does that mean it then looks like you're creating stuff out of nothing? Right. You're not, you know what I mean? Like you're fabricating now. Those types of questions have to be, and that's not what we would be doing, but those types of questions and those types of impacts would definitely have to be considered. But I think there's a lot of interesting stuff um, that I don't even know of, you know, that's, hmm. that's coming down the pipeline. Is um, James Webb one of your dear friends also, <laughs> data friends? I, James Webb is one of my new friends on the block, okay. and I'm very interested in getting to know that friend better. Um, we've done some work um, already with James Webb data. We released some composites between the mm -hmm. Chandrix Observatory and the James Webb, and they were stunning. They were stunning and very, very popular. It was so lovely to kind of see that public response. And actually with Matt, we sonified two James Webb images mm -hmm. so far as well. And those were also just really beautiful aesthetic things to like have mm -hmm. as part of this, you know, collection of materials. Um, and so I think what's coming from the James Webb will just be very, very exciting. Like this is an incredibly powerful it tool. Is. It's really lifting mm. the curtain on a number of areas in infrared astronomy and just the depth of the data. Mm. I mean. Do you remember the moment of the launch? Where were you? Oh, Where Christmas? were you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was on Christmas. And so, yeah, I remember like, like just kind of waking up kind of groggily and just being like, oh, it's Christmas. Oh, wait, James Webb. Yeah, yeah. It was such a weird yeah. thing when it launched on that day. For me, though, I remember where I was when I first started seeing the data. And oddly enough, I was on vacation on Cape Cod. And I, my family gets very upset with me when I'm doing work yeah, yeah, on right. vacation. Mom, it's Christmas. So I was kind of trying to like look yeah. through the data very sort of secretively and being like, oh, this is stunning. Yeah. Um, and then going back to walk on the beach. So yeah, it's it really is um, a true, exciting tool that we now have for for the universe. And that's what all these telescopes are, right? Like they're different tools in your tool belt and you have to pull out the right tool to do the right thing. You know, you don't hang up uh, a picture by screwing in something and using the back of a hammer to like, you, like you have to do the right tool for the job. So having the right tool for these questions that we have about our universe is critically important. Mm. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Oh, who, is, sure. who is Kim Arcan? Ooh, oh, dear. I don't know. Deep questions. Let me see. <laughs> So um, I'm a I'm a science storyteller. I'm a, a big fan of data. Pretty much love data. Uh, coder, former coder, current coder, depending. Um, someone who's always curious. I'm a mom um, and a wife and a daughter. And my family is very important to me. I'm also a huge gardener. I I think it goes back to that whole. I really don't like to take our planet for granted. Hmm. Um, I just love being able to put things in the earth and seeing them grow. And since I live in New England, that means in the winter I have to garden indoors extensively. Mm -hmm. And that means my house is like half covered in plants. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just, I'm someone who likes to ask a lot of questions. I'm someone who's always curious. Um, I'm not an artist, but I have an artistic part of my brain. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm useless with like paint brushes and clay. Like my hands don't do what I can see in my brain. The hands have no skills. Um, but I have like, um, I guess an aesthetic understanding that I try to bring to my work. Um, I consider myself deeply ethical. I actually took ethics classes as part of my master's and find that really important and wish more, um, people would study ethics and try to take that with them into their various jobs. I'm passionate about accessibility because I feel like I hate it when only I have access to something and other people don't. Um, and I kind of just love being outside with my dogs and sometimes inside with my cat and my kids on a rainy day. Hmm. That's, that's, that's me. How do you... How can we uh, tell people about the beauty of space? Hmm. 
Well, I hope that's what this I'm is, doing. This is, this is what you're doing. but <laughs> I hope I'm, I've been doing that for the last 25 yeah. years. If not, I'm failing. Um, but yeah, no, I think it's about meeting people where they are, right? Like no one wants to listen to a scientist who's tucked up tall in their ivory tower and doesn't deign to descend, right? Like it's about meeting people where they are, right? Like at the end of the day, I get to sit in this beautiful cathedral every day, this universe, if you will. And I can sit there in my little chair and just time travel back through the universe by, you know, glimpsing at this stuff. And I can look at that beautiful stained glass window and think, you know, oh, that's incredible. That's so beautiful. And I can also think, like, how did they build this structure, mm -hmm. right? I want everybody to sit in that cathedral with me. And so in order to do that, it's just about bringing the data to where people are, whether that is creating data into a sonification, whether that is creating the data uh, visualization, whether that is whatever it is it's doing, bringing images into a public park, whatever. Um, it's about taking the time to move beyond your own, you know, four walls mm. and and meeting people where they are. On my way to the studio, yeah. I came by an advertisement by pa uh, Patagonia. Okay, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the brand. Yep. I saw and a that, girl by then. That was a really interesting one. Not Mars? One. Not Is Mars, that one? Exactly. Yes, I thought it was so impactful. So what do you, I, I think it's it's brilliant. Not it is Mars. We simple. Have, mm -hmm. We have enough problems on yeah. Earth. But yeah. that doesn't speak to you as an uh, as a space communicator. Yeah. Well, I like their point, though, because, I mean, for people who just want to terraform Mars to live there as a plan B, I'm not one of those, like, this planet is so important, right? So, like, for me... I understand that kind of point of view because I think it's critically important to think about what we need to do here to make sure our planet is safe for future generations. At the same time, Mars is cool, right? I just don't want to live there. <laughs> <laughs> I would like data from Mars and understand like what it would be like to experience things on Mars, perhaps, but I don't. I don't ever want to have to live there, and I wouldn't want to have any great, great, great grandchildren of mine like, to live there either. You can't open your windows up on Mars. Right, exactly. There's nothing you there, can do. No. It's like living in the trailer for exactly. good for life. Exactly. That to me is horrifying. Seriously. Like it really is. Like to never feel the strength of the sun on yeah. your face, to never be out in a rainstorm, to never plant anything in the ground under the sun. Like I think that's I a think nightmare. I think after the first week, things get boring up there. I think so too. For unless, the rest of your life. unless we're very different creatures in in two hundred yeah. years, which is possible, maybe there's some you know meta world that's very different, and everybody's very digital. Then I don't know, but that's heartbreaking to me. What I don't know if you if, if you know enough about um, plant growth, interstellar plant <laughs> growth, but would would it be possible to grow potatoes? In and on Martian soil. I mean, it would have to be fertilized properly and you would have to have the some sort of light source and you would have to take into consideration how you're watering all of those things that were in the movie, for example, like have to be thought out very, very thoroughly. So it should be possible. But like hmm, kind of depressing as much as I love potatoes. I don't think I would want to be stuck with just a diet of Martian potatoes and perhaps strawberries. Um, for the rest of my life, like those types of decisions, I think they're useful to think about. It is useful to research those things for sure. But I don't know. That's if we, I think if we wanted to grow something, we would do it artificially in, yeah. in, in grow pots. Right. Guess, it would not, have to be. Not on. It would have to be. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, I don't, I think I'd be much happier here on Earth. Yeah. So unless there's like an asteroid coming at that point, wherever, how far in the future this is, I would sincerely hope we could stick with our own planet. And there's an interesting mission, of course, uh, you know, of course, the planetary defense mission, yes. DART and yes. ERA, ISA yeah. and NASA. Yeah. yeah, it's an incredibly important thing. I mean, we live in a universe, right? We, yes, we live on a planet. That planet is in a solar system. That solar system is in a galaxy. That galaxy is in a group. That group is in the universe, right? So there is no reason for us to bury our heads in the sand. Like, I'm not a, an alarmist, henny penny, sky is falling kind of thing, but it is useful to have, I'm, I'm a data person, right? Mm -hmm. You want to have the data. Mm -hmm. You want to understand what's what's coming. Because even if there's something on a smaller scale that's approaching, you know, something that would say level a village, like not the entire planet, that's, you want to protect the village, right? So having the data in order to do that is really important. So all of the minor planetary center, the minor planetary bodies that people are researching, I think it's critically important to do that because we have the tools. 
So why not take the time to understand your micro universe, like around the earth, right? And then also the universe at large. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't we want to do that? Yeah. <laughs> you know? What piece of data are you looking forward to working with? Oh, wow. That's an open question. So right now we're actually in the middle of, of working on celebrating Chandra's 25th. Like we're starting to make all the plans to celebrate the 25th next year. And so uh, I'm so just... Is it a symphony? Because it's like the so, 25th. Ten, enough, we are hoping yeah. to have um, like a symphony event with a sonic yeah. patient. Um, but we're just digging through the archives and finding all of these little gold nuggets in there. You know, that treasure chest again. It's just you're combing through all these yeah. different bits and pieces. And we're just finding these little nuggets that, again, in 25 years, I have never seen. I've never laid eyes on some of these data sets. And we're just starting to dust off those little nuggets mm. and, and prepare them to do some cool things with. So for me, I'm kind of stuck in that right now. Um, but beyond that, I'm, I'm really looking forward to additional, you know, more multi-wavelength astronomy, working with more James Webb data, um, keep going with these new, under, these new ways of understanding, this new, new ways of making meaning, new ways of adding value to the data that's in the archives, right? Because data that's in archives has a potential value, um, but data that's been processed has like this added value mm -hmm. to it. So yeah, for me, I don't know. I'm, I'm very open at the moment. It's been, it's been a wild ride, but mm. it's been pretty fun. Mm. Is this a moment, a pocket in time? I mean, like everything is changing right now. So yeah. we're reshifting society and, yeah. and humanity on Earth. Yeah. Is this also a moment in time where we are at the precipice of something new when it comes to research in outer space, for outer space, about outer space? I do think so. We what are, are you expecting? We are definitely in this like really incredible moment. Like all of these, these great observatories that we have, the data coming from the Event Horizon Telescope of the black holes, these new larger um, uh, dishes that will be launching on Earth, new satellites that are going to be launching in the next decades. Like all of these, like it's a truly amazing era for astronomy. And when you start to couple that with not only the incredible work in data science that's already been done, but the upcoming work with AI and machine learning and all that that I do will do think will greatly impact the field. I mean, I can really see us opening up and kind of cracking open some of these mysteries on things like black holes, on things of the formation of the universe, how things first got here, those first stars, those first black holes. How did supermassive black holes get so big so fast? We really don't mm. understand that. And like, what happens next? You know, like the universe is kind of dissipating out into this cold, lonely void. Sounds really depressing. Is that really what's going to happen? I don't know. Is but it, that's that's the sort of thing that like that they're working on. That we're evaporating in some into something. I mean, I don't know if we're evaporating. Well, I guess Ray, right, everybody is in a way. But um, you can think of like black holes. Black holes are supposedly supposed to sort of slowly dissipate out, mm -hmm. right? But that's like ten to the sixty-four years, right? That's mm -hmm. ten with sixty-four zeros. That's a long time. So time is the one thing that like it's hard to really fathom, mm -hmm. right? Because we understand and we speak at human time scales mm -hmm. but the universe it's a different beast those time scales are ginormous and it's really hard to understand like how that will change and evolve over those incredible time scales but it's it's exciting regardless i love not knowing the obvious question but it's necessary mm. are we alone <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, my former biologist self would just say, like, yeah, maybe, because it's awfully hard to get all of the right ingredients smushed together in just the right conditions and all of that, right? It seems like we've just got it too good to be true. We've got our perfect sun that was neither too temperamental when it was young nor too boring, and it's just boring enough for us, and it's just the right size, and we're at just the right distance of our habitable zone, right? All of those little Goldilocks principle. things. Yes, yeah. right? Those perfect things that yeah. had to happen that I think are so cool. But then it's the numbers. It's the numbers. When you do the math, it just seems impossible to me at that scale of magnitude of how many planets there are out there, regardless of how many planets have glass raining sideways, ripping you to shreds, the other planets must exist where there's a more habitable place where life can develop. I don't know. I just have to think it is. I think it'd be an incredibly lonely universe if we're it. And how much pressure is that to be absolutely perfect if we're it in the entire universe, right? That just yeah, seems absolutely. impossible. I mean, like, was it Enrico Fermi who said that no, it wasn't Enrico Fermi. It was a a famous 
space a science fiction author oh. who said both answers to the question as to if we're alone are f- equally frightening. Mm, yes, because yes. We're, so I love science fiction that, writers because they do frame things so beautifully and whatever they tend yeah. to write seems to come true. Yeah. Um, it is incredible. Because, I mean, like, it's super frightening to say, it is. yes, we're alone. Yeah, I'm like, wow. Wow. That's and we're not alone. <laughs> wow. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We're not alone. To me, in my mind, I don't know, again, going back to the biology side of things, I always kind of think of it as like amoeba yeah. living there, right? Yeah. But obviously there could be something else, and that could be a scary thing, but who knows? Yeah. But I love thinking about it. One of my favorite movies is Contact, because I yeah. love that idea of, like, what could life be like elsewhere? What kind of advancements yeah. might they have gotten to? Yeah. What kind of place might they have, you know, reached? And, like, do we have the hope of of getting to a really incredible state like that? Like, do we have the possibility of being that incredible, that good, that impactful? I don't know. Huh. Yeah. I didn't like the ending of that movie. You didn't? No. I did. It was too cheesy. I mean, I, I loved the it. movie. Yeah. But then it, when it started to get... I liked it. Let I really did. I just thought it was yeah. so interesting. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um. Provided that you're planning on going on an interstellar <laughs> journey anytime soon, um, it's going to be very boring. Yeah, um, very. It's a long haul. Too long. So yeah, like I don't um, want to go to New Zealand because it's too far. <laughs> so I feel like my chances of going elsewhere are pretty slim. <laughs> so my question would be: What tune would you want to bring <laughs> on a Spotify playlist? <laughs> Because we do that have is that. so hard. I only get one for all that distance. No, no, seriously, we have a Spotify playlist for the future space traveler, and I get I ask each guest for their introduction to that playlist. Okay, 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 okay. All right, I have to narrow it down. My top three. I mm, so I love Stevie Wonder, <laughs> Stevie Nicks, and Bill Withers. So I would say, ooh, I don't know. I can't pick. Yeah. Um, Lovely day, I guess, because I would need something happy for Good. that. And that would make me think of Earth. While looking out of the window. Yeah, exactly. I think I would need it something happy. happy. Yeah. Yeah. Good. It would loop yeah. it. For... Yes. I am scared by how yeah. much the looping would <laughs> turn me into a mad person. But yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. I do think that would be, that'd be, happy. yeah, that would be it. I'd have to leave the two Stevies behind. And that is really sad. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But so... I'll pick Bill. Mm-hmm. Good. So be it. Okay. And then um, this podcast is called Space Cafe Podcast. It's a okay. coffee place. Yes, yeah. And in coffee places, you now and then have an espresso to energize yourself. Now, why don't you share an espresso for the mind with me, with the audiences, to inspire and energize the audience? You can pick whatever kind of topic you want to pick. I don't know. I feel like I've given all yes. my espressos yeah, you spilled, away already. You spilled I, it all. I don't know if I have anything left. Um... Maybe something that apl- uh, applies to younger generations, future generations, communication, awareness, whatnot. But I'm, I'm mm. talking too much. I mean, I don't know. But I, I think the one thing I do like to tell people is that we know so very little. So pretty much the future of the universe is everybody else's to discover. Like the next generation that's starting to think now of these things, like they have the opportunity to potentially find life somewhere, to to potentially dig really deep into black holes, to potentially dig really deep into the future of our universe and the birth of our universe, like all of these things that are just such still like unknowns. Um, I think it's this idea that astronomy is still, we we just have the tiniest little sprinkle of knowledge, right? And there's Mm -hmm. so, so, so much more that's left to uncover. And I hope that inspires new generations to just look up or listen up, right? Like just, I don't know, keep keep thinking about things beyond our own planet without neglecting our own planet. Mm. Yeah, that's all I've got. I feel like I really gave away all my good ones. No, 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 it's really good. Mm. Um, but you opened another can of worms um, mm. talking about potential life out there. So yeah. you're working with slash for NASA. Um, mm. If NASA had any information... <laughs> Would they talk about it? Or is there... I would just say, having worked for the government for that long, already like 25 years, I don't think that secret could be kept. I'll be honest. I really don't think it could be kept for that long. 
Um, no, I don't think so. Because we, we had this very weird balloon stuff going yeah. on a couple of weeks ago. Yes. So and that was known pretty generally pretty quickly. But I do I do think that And we, why would we keep I mean like, what I never understood is why would we keep it secret? I don't know either. I that doesn't make any sense to me. I also don't think you could tight lip that quick enough. I really yeah. don't. You would have had somebody talk by now for sure. Um yeah, to me uh, no. I don't think we have and I think the possibility that we could is so slim, but it is very exciting to think about, right? It is very exciting to think about what other life might be like. What are those other forms, creatures, whatever, doing, thinking, behaving, right. you know? And then the odds are very low that this life is a technological form of life yeah. as we are. This is just too obvious. Right, exactly, exactly. So yeah, I don't know, but I don't know. It's, it is really cool to think of though. Mm. Excellent. Mm. And thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much for, for taking me. the time. Oh, great. What a fascinating journey we've been on today in this episode of the Space Cafe podcast. We've covered topics from the soundscapes of the universe to the infinite possibility of alien life, reminding us how much more there is to learn and explore about the cosmos. We've heard about the importance of communication and the efforts of our brilliant guest in taking astronomical discoveries and making them accessible to everyone. We've also discussed the prospect of space travel, the challenges of long-haul journeys, and even put together a single track for our future Interstellar Spotify playlist, Bill Withers' Lovely Day, a song that promises to keep our spirits high when we're out there looking back at our beautiful blue planet. Finally, we explored a thought-provoking espresso for the mind. A reminder that we are just at the beginning of uncovering the mysteries of the universe. A call to the next generation of astronomers and thinkers to not just look up, but listen up. There is so much more to discover beyond our own planet without neglecting Earth. Thank you to our guest for such an insightful conversation and to you, our listeners, for joining us on this cosmic journey. Keep looking up, keep wandering, and we'll see you in the next episode of the Space Cafe podcast. Bye-bye, my friends. <laughs> <laughs>